How you doing? We're going to branch out into X-ray and thermodynamics. <laughs> cool. All right, we're just going to get going here. Yeah. All right, uh, Lee, yes. you played an acoustic set last year here at the Circle Jerk Show. I did. Thank what you influenced you to decide to do an acoustic set? Uh, I was doing that way before I was doing this. All right. <laughs> so uh, it was an opportunity to do that. Cool. Which is very fun, and so I took it. Hopped right on. on. Hopped on it. Right on. A good time was had by all. All right, that answers my question. Next question. All right, if you won the super billion dollar lottery tomorrow, what would you do with the money? Oh shit! Let's see. That's a good question. Well, I'd uh, maybe I'd go out and get a job. <laughs> do, do something unusual. You know? All right. Okay. Uh, where do you see punk in ten years? Uh, you know, quite truthfully, I'm not sure where I see it today. Uh, should I ask this one? Where do you see punk in a hundred years? <laughs> <laughs> in a book. In a book. Okay. Uh, who or what pisses you off more than anything right now? Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> uh, newscasters that insist on adding their opinion to the news. Uh, describe an average day for Lee. <laughs> describe an average day for leaving. <laughs> oh, let's see. I wake up, I make a cup of espresso, I play a little golf, I watch the news, check out CNN. Fox News, MSNBC, and uh, Headline News, get a scoop on whether or not it's safe to go outside, <laughs> and uh, start playing the guitar. Cool. Uh, if you could play a gig at any venue in the world, where would it be? Let's see. Well, Madison Square Garden would be one place. The Inglewood, Inglewood Forum would be another, I like that. Uh, the uh, Cow Palace in Frisco, that might be okay. Nah, forget that. Uh, no, the Mormon Tabernacle, that might be nice. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, where was your favorite venue that you've played at of all the places? Uh, let's see. Saturday Night Live was kind of fun. That was a nice venue. <laughs> That's one of my questions. <laughs> The, uh, what was that place down the street that we used to play in that of our, uh, the uh, Palladium? Palladium was a good place to play. Orrin Tucker's Stardust Ballroom was great. The Whiskey and the Starwood was cool. The original Mask uh, down on Las Palmas, that was very cool. Cool. I thought that was a great place to play. Maybe be better than all the others. And where was your least favorite? Uh, the least favorite was also Saturday Night Live. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, anything you want to tell your fans? Sure. Sitting is important and standing out. Now, standing and sitting will sit you in good standing. <laughs> anything you want to tell anybody else? Yeah, fuck off. <laughs> All right. Uh, this last question, one last. Uh, Fear played on Saturday Night Live in the early 80s. Describe that. That was a, uh, a pastiche of panache which sank beneath the hoist of its own petard. <laughs> I also had a couple questions. I had a list like his, but I left mine at home by accident. Lists are useless. Yeah, I, well... I, uh, I lived in Philly for 10 years. Oh, no kidding. And uh, I wanted to know, you know, where exactly you lived and how, the, you know, how living in Philly might have influenced your music. Greatly, I would say. And uh, I lived in, the, I was born. Uh, you mentioned Avenue C in one of the songs. Right. Well, Avenue C is a street in New York. It may also oh, be a street in other towns, but the one I was writing about was in oh, New York okay. City on the Lower East Side where I also lived for a while. But I was born in Kensington, Allegheny, in Philadelphia, in a place called Fishtown. It was a hardcore factory town, full of toughs, and it's worse now than it was then. Or better, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> just talked to a friend of mine in, just in Philly. He told me that um, there's a fear cover band still out there called Beer. God bless them. God bless them. I wish them well. Yeah, they were wondering how you felt about you know, people covering your material. Oh, man, tell them to call me up. I got a lot of tips for hangovers. <laughs> question. I was emailing uh, Sarget a couple of years ago, I guess like a year and a half ago. He told me that after you guys recorded uh, Fuck Christmas at the Quad, that's when Flea came in and you did some demos with Flea that were released. That were not released. They weren't released right. in that set of demos that's that kind of released later with the Chili Pepper stuff, I guess. Or, I don't know. And I wanted to know if any 
those demos don't, occurred, uh, I, guess you had I don't believe that there ever were any demos with Flea on them. In fact, I believe that there was no recording with him at all during the entire two years of our being together. We made a record immediately after that, and we had the bass player from the Dickies. And that was live for the record, recorded at KPFK, and, uh, which we released. But prior to that, what can you do? You recall what songs Man, he said? I had my notes there's one song that's a bit of road. He started with the D. Was Bomb Lizard the Russians. Or something. Uh, Lizard or something like that. He told responsibility. We recorded a song called Responsibility. Flea was not on it. We recorded another song that Spit wrote called Bomb the Russians, which I wrote with him. He and I wrote that together, and that was not Flea. That was also uh, Lorenzo. So, as far as I know, uh, Spit's memory of their existing demo tapes with Flea on them is erroneous. It's, it's a, a, a construction. <laughs> but yet, yeah, last year we were playing the Warp Tour, we were in Ventura, Flea was in the crowd, and I jumped off and gave him a big old bear hug and said, come on up and play something with us. So he came up and played I Don't Care About You with us. And there must have been, you know, there's like maybe 10,000 people in front of the stage and 60,000 people on the property milling around. But when I started hollering about Flea from the Chili Peppers and Fear coming, the whole mob come up to the stage. We had a really good show. It was great to see him. Right. <laughs> there, there exists that, and also uh, we think that maybe we would do some more recording with Flea at some point. You know, when, when he has time, he's very busy, so it's hard to hook it up. But we stay in touch, and we're still good friends. And at some point, I think we will do we will do that. And the other question I have was the last question: Could you explain for me the silly coincidence of the song titles of uh, you know, "I Don't Care About You" versus "I Don't Care Without You" and uh, "Flying" versus "Hugs and Flying." Right. Well, you can you see the theme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see the theme, and the, one is like from the meat case, and the other is sort so of like. like one song a, for albums going to be devoted to like, no, no, not something new, but still, still familiar. Not necessarily, but you know, a, a good cut of meat is always a worthy topic. <laughs> and naturally, if you had your dreathers, your choice between two types of salami, like either. Uh, Genoa salami, or like a koro salami, right? You take it, you take it a koro salami because Genoa salami—that's a soft salami, right? You don't, want, you don't want nothing to do with that. The girls they don't like that, right? You want a koro salami, right? So that's what we write. Yeah. You know, and it's a, we, I, thought, I thought beef bologna was such a romantic song that it deserved a follow-up. <laughs> You know, I know that our crowd has, you know, I know that we play on their heartstrings, and so I just wanted to continue. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Oh, you're certainly welcome, man. Thanks a lot.